Today we're looking at the loop of Henle, which is part of the nephron of kidney. The loop of Henle is responsible for reabsorbing water. So clearly for desert animals, for animals that live in dry conditions, the loop of Henle is extremely important and it takes on a longer anatomy in those creatures. So these tubes here, this is where we've had the glomerular filtrate from the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. And we've already gone through the proximal convoluted tube and we're now in this bit, which is the start of the loop of Henle. As we carry on, it goes to the distal convoluted tubule and down through the collecting duct. We've got the outer cortex and we've got the inner medulla. The thing to remember beyond this diagram is that the whole thing is surrounded in blood capillaries and they don't feature on this diagram. So we have to remember that. If we put them on, it would just be too fussy and you wouldn't make sense of it. And also the cells that form this space in between the tubules is called the interstitial space. And again, beyond that are all the blood capillaries. So this is our descending limb. Descending goes down. And this is our ascending limb. The ascending limb goes up into the atmosphere. That's how I always remember remembered which way around ascending and descending were. Just to go over some of those names, we've got the ascending limb, the base of the hairpin loop. This whole thing is considered to be a hairpin shape. We've got the ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule, and of course the collecting duct there. We've got the interstitial space that runs across the whole of the inner medulla. We're going to consider the loop of Henle as three parts, the descending, the uh, base and the ascending. And the thing about these three parts is the first half here of the descending limb is totally permeable to water. That means water can easily pass out of this tube into the surrounding tissue, which is called the interstitial tissue or the interstitial space. Contrary to that, the ascending limb is made of uh, greater, thicker cells, which are impermeable, so they don't allow the passage of water out into the interstitial space. And then the third point I'd like to make is about the base. What we want to remember is that the most concentrated filtrate occurs here. In other words, the water potential is the most lowest, is the most negative at the base. So we're just going to remember those three facts. Permeable, impermeable, and this is where we find the water potential at its absolute lowest. Now, the cells that line this tube have got a lot of mitochondria in there and straight away that makes us realise that they're going to be using mitochondria for active transport. And indeed what they do is they actively transport out sodium ions from the filtrate. And the impact of moving all of those sodium ions out of that tubule is it creates a really low water potential here which we mean is more negative and what we mean by that is it's got lots and lots of solutes in it. Now normally the water would want to follow that from the filtrate and it would follow it by osmosis but remember we said that the cells here on this tubule are impermeable to water. But if you remember, we said that the walls of the descending limb were permeable to water. So what happens is the filtrate, as it passes through here, it's very watery, comes through and the water moves out from the descending limb into the interstitial um, tissue fluid by osmosis. And of course, remembering that this is overlapped by lots and lots of blood capillaries and as that water moves out of the tube, it then moves into the blood capillaries and away. 
Now, if you remember, we said that one of the things you were going to remember was that the filtrate in here, at the base of the hairpin, is the most concentrated. In other words, it's got the lowest water potential. And that's because as this is pumping out sodium ions, down the length of the descending limb, water moves out. So the solutes in here begin to get more and more concentrated. So when they get down to there, they're actually at their most concentrated. They then begin to lose that concentration because they get pumped out here. But certainly at this base here, it's the most concentrated it can be, the lowest water potential. So remember, water is of primary importance to us. And the thing that we're trying to do is conserve our water and collect as much of it as we can. Remember that the whole point of the loop of Henley is to reabsorb as much water. And I'll just draw your attention to this collecting duct here. And that is also permeable to water. And by drawing it out of these tubes, it then goes into the blood vessels, which aren't shown on here, and back into our system. Now what we're working towards here is something called the counter current system. And we've seen that before when we looked at fish gills. If two tubes were running in parallel and we had diffusion taking place, then what we end up with is a system where we've got 50%, 50%, 50-50, it's in equilibrium. However, when we've got counter currents, when they're running opposite each other, remember that the concentration gradient is maintained along the whole length. And that is what we're working towards here. So let's stick some numbers on this. Um, if we were measuring the water potential here, well clearly a lot of sodium ions have been pumped out here, so the water potential might be less here, let's call it 400, than it would be here, here, let's call that 700. And again, as we move further down the tube, remember we said that at the bottom, this is where we have the lowest water potential, the most concentration of solutes, I might call that 900, and I might call that 1200 there. Now here, we've got the water, the filtrate coming through, it's got lots of water in there, a lot of the glucose has been reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tube, so the water potential here isn't particularly low. Let's call it 300. However, as the water begins to move out of the descending limb, it will then become uh, more concentrated the water potential will become lower. And so on until we're at the base and that's where we've got the lowest water potential of all. So just to recap, we started our story here. We said that these uh, walls of the tubule are impermeable to water. We said that they are rich in mitochondria because sodium ions are actively pumped out of there and the effect therefore is that water follows from the descending limb. As water follows from the descending limb, the concentration of solutes in here increases, which decreases the water potential. The water comes out, where does it go? It goes into the capillaries, the blood vessels that surround this tubule that aren't shown in this diagram. So they're pulled out, it's reabsorbed into the blood and it goes back around the body. So it follows that we're going to have a gradient for water potential with the highest water potential here, in other words, the most water, and the lowest poten water potential here, i.e. the least water and the more solutes. So I'm just going to remove this off my diagram and we'll label our water potential gradient. Now the key thing that we're trying to achieve is we're trying to achieve a counter current system 
along the whole length of this collecting duct, which is also permeable to water. And a lot of our water has already been absorbed because sodium ions have been pumped out, the water has moved out of this tube, they've gone into the blood capillaries and gone off. And as the water has been removed and the sodium ions have been pumped out, this filtrate also seemingly decreases in its solute concentration and it becomes a higher water potential. But that's only because the water's gone and the ions have gone too. So that's why we have this relative sort of increase in water potential. So when you get to here, you may think job done, that basically we've got um, a nice solution there, we've reabsorbed a lot of water, however we can do better than that. And the reason we can do better than that is because as this filtrate now moves through this distal convoluted tubule and down the collecting duct, we have this countercurrent system taking place. So now as this filtrate has moved through the loop of Henle and it's passing through here and it's got a relatively high water potential, a lot of the water has been reabsorbed, but we can do better than that. Because this countercurrent system exists, the osmosis gradient, the water potential gradient, is maintained along its whole length. So we get to absorb water by osmosis all the way through it. And that is the reason why the animals that live in dry conditions will have a really long hairpin loop um, compared to others. So as this filtrate moves down here, it's going to move out and it will become more concentrated as it passes down this tubule. But what's going to happen is this gradient ensures it continues to move. So we call this the countercurrent multiplier system. Now in the next lesson, we're going to look more closely at this area here, the distal convoluted tubule. This is where it gets really cool. We find that um, we can alter the cells in here by changing the number of water protein channels in the membrane. And that is under the control of a hormone called uh, antidiuretic hormone. And it changes the amount of water we're able to reabsorb. It's a little bit like we saw with insulin, where the vesicles are holding these protein channels and they'll move to the membrane and fuse with it. The difference in this case is that they're called aquaporins.